<laughs> okay, so welcome to lecture two. Um, what is that an image of? At the BC, they'll be like, uh, uh, it's a woman. <laughs> I, I actually don't know, and you're like, wow, this is, I know you're post church, but this is really intense. Mary. Mary. Is Mary. 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 Jesus. 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 Is it possible to stand to the side because you're standing right in front of it? Not that a halo didn't put it on your butt. <laughs> you might want to move so you might want to you might want to move like in terms I assume I think if you're here I'm not going to be able to do that so you, you might want to move um, um, okay so so this is um, from the, the Church of Hagia Sophia in, Const in Istanbul the mosque Museum, which was the largest church in Christendom for a thousand years. Um, does anyone know what happened in 1453 in Turkey? A massacre. The Nicene. A massacre. <laughs> well, yeah. the Nicene. Nope. 1453. Oh, wasn't that the split between? Nope. That was 1053. Oh, the fall of Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, ended. Oh, Mehmet the Conqueror of the Ottoman Turks. Um, conquered and um, it became the Ottoman Empire and it became a Muslim Turkish Empire. Um, the Byzantine Empire was slowly shrinking until it was basically a city-state by the late, by the mid-1400s and finally the great city of Constantinople, Constantine the Great's, the Emperor Constantine's Eastern Roman capital fell um, and was actually, it's, it, it, the name was kept Constantinia. Um, Istanbul is um, from the Greek stopoli, which means to the city. And so this was a Turkish rendering of the Greek. Um, and to this day, Greeks in, in Greece will still refer to Istanbul as the city, um, the great city. So um, it, uh, and in Russian, it's called Tsarigrad, the city of the emperor. Uh, to so it's it's interesting that and um, does anyone know what happened in Turkey after World War One around 1920? Is that the Armenian massacre? N no, no, that was um, that. You're right. That was just before, but something happened radical to the Ottoman Empire. It collapsed. It collapsed, it collapsed and became yeah. the Republic of Turkey under who? Ataturk. Ataturk. So Kemal. Um, Ataturk became the president of the new Republic of Turkey. He secularized the country. He changed the script from Arabic to Latin characters to the Roman alphabet. Um, he secularized it. He made this the Hagia Sophia a museum, and they, all the whitewashed mosaics were uncovered, which had lasted hundreds and hundreds of years. And this was this is the mosaic in the apse of this huge church that you can still visit to this day. All right, so we're continuing to talk about, um, we started talking about mon uh, the doctrine of God and about faith. And of course, since we look, looked at Hagia Sophia, this is the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, which was reached its current form in 381 AD. The first Nicene Creed was 325, and it was expanded by the Council of Constantinople in 381. It was, of course, written in Greek, just like the New Testament was written in Greek, and we can listen to it um, since everything in the church was sung except the sermon until relatively recently. Um, this, uh, these are monks chanting the original version of the Nicene Creed, and we'll see if this works. Tastiras, tastiras, en Sofia Στα προφέτα τα υπερημόνια του Ποντίου Πιλάτου, 
que é mafota aqui da fenda, que é na sala de trem que libera cartas e rapaz, que é na foto e sus ratos, que é cada jovem na igreja do patroz, que é pai e agora na metalopsis, rindes ondas que é negros, útis vacilias, mulheres e pelos. E é isso a pneuma do alho, o quilo, o zóio, o eco patroz e o corebômeno, o simpatrico e o símbolo que é número, que é símbolo que é jovem, o valeu e o santiago o profitor. Ισβία, Αγία, Καθολική και Αποστολική Εκκλησία, ομολογώ έμπλα τη Μαϊ Σάπτη Καμαρτιών, προσδοκώ ανάσταση νεκρών και ζωή του μέλλοντο αιώνα. Αμήν. Did anyone get any word that they think they understood? The last word was Amen. Yes, Amen. Yes, that was there. <coughs> yes. Um, so a Catholic, Catholic universal. So one holy Catholic and apostolic church was in there. Grafas, you may have heard, that's the scriptures. And one of the most famous phrases, homologion patri, of one substance with the Father, was in there. There's these classic phrases that culminate in 381 to form the creed that many churches say every Sunday, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Anglican, um, some Lutherans say it. Um, uh, other Protestant churches say the Nicene Creed quite rarely, although they still have it as one of their symbols. Um, the Apostles' Creed is more common. In this church, the Apostles' Creed was said every Sunday, I think until the 60s is when it fell out. Um, but, a, but some congregational churches still recite it. But it's still recited by almost all Presbyterian, Reformed, and other churches. The Apostles' Creed is a shorter version. The Apostles' Creed is actually not older. It was not formed until about 781. Um, it was the Roman baptismal symbol. It was said by people about to be baptized in Rome. And eventually it took its current form, the Apostles' Creed, and um, is now popular with some Protestants. Okay. But as I mentioned before, um, everything is, was sung in early Christian churches, almost everything, except for the sermon. Mm -hmm. um, this is um, an Orthodox Church of America liturgy where the creed is sung in English, with English words so you will understand it. Um, well, the, uh, the Orthodox Church in America was, is, a, is an autocephalous church, which means self-headed. It's the only American church that's independent which means it's, it's patriarch or archbishop it leads the church independently because Orthodox churches um, are self-headed, like the Patriarch of Moscow heads the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, etc. And um, the, But it was founded by Russian immigrants. Um, and eventually they switched from Russian to English. They wanted to Americanize. And so this is an English. So they still use Russian sometimes, but they mostly use English. So this is, chant, this is the creed chanted pretty much a verbatim translation in English as it would be sung in an, in an Orthodox church. St. Vladimir's Seminary in Crestwood, New York is their main seminary. So now we can hear it in English.
Um, let me see. In the Greek, originally, it doesn't mention dead. It doesn't? No, um, it, but it's implied. It, it, so it was an expansion. It's accepted as valid. Um, what, what's also missing, if you come from the Western tradition, is the filioque clause. Um, who, uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That was added by Spain in the 7th century as a gloss. Um, it wasn't added in Rome until about the year 1000, because Rome is very conservative about innovation. Um, but this was one of the reasons in 1053 that the East and West split. They said, you're not allowed to change the creed, and you did, by adding and the sun. Very minor point of doctrine to most of us, but at the time, it's a thing. So the, the what Easterns don't say uh, that particular. They say the Spirit only proceeds from the Father. And although the rest is pretty much identical. Um, yeah, but you're right, though. In the Greek, it doesn't say that. Yep. Where does the source of the very God... The so truly God. It's just old-fashioned. Okay. It's interesting because the, o the OCA usually uses modern English without any thee, thy, thou, because it's not, you know, they don't come from that background. They're not, they're not, they didn't use J the King James version of the Bible. They're not Anglo. Um, Jacobian English, so they don't do that, but sometimes they use very old-fashioned words. Also, the grammar on the English was actually wrong sometimes. Whose and whose was wrong. W, it was whose, W-H-O-S-E. I noticed these things. I'm always like, that's wrong. Oh, never mind. Um, yeah. Why did this seem overblown? I mean, it, was, it seemed like, um, you know, Americanized, we got to throw in all these different pitches, bass, and roll with it all. Oh, you mean the video? No, the music itself. <laughs> you know, the music itself. Well, the music is a chant, as a Russian chant. Yes, a Russian but it, that chant. didn't sound like a chant. It sounded more like a great church choir with the end and uh, 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 uh. You know, it didn't yeah. sound as rhythmic as the chant. It sounded more like, I'm going to say music, for lack of a better word. Well, it would be. So the Russian, the, um, it's interesting. The, the monks that were chanting the original Greek were using a monotone chant um, that would have been familiar even to, even in the 300s. Um, although, uh, there are different ways to sing it. Um, the Greeks, the Greek Orthodox say the Russian Orthodox are decadent because they like very fancy music and they have very elaborate churches, although the Greek churches are pretty elaborate. The Russian churches are even more elaborate. And they say that, you know, they went too far. And even though it's the same exact liturgy, that they they went um, they went beyond what's necessary, but it's also because the Russian Empire took over as the the third Rome. Moscow called itself Third Rome after the fall of Constantinople, Second Rome. First Rome is Rome, and so the Tsar said, "Well, I've inherited this now that Constantinople is gone," and so that's why their liturgy was so elaborate, um, and that's why because the the Greeks lost their great church and their great liturgy and all the trappings of the emperor were gone. So what people don't realize about the Byzantine Empire, they called themselves the Roman Empire. They actually called themselves Romans. The, the Turkish word for the Greek Orthodox minority is Rum, Roman. 
R-H-U-M, it's the Turkish word for Rome. So the Rum are Greeks that are Christian who still live in Turkey. That's still the word. So the word in Turkish for the Greek Orthodox Church is the Rum Orthodox Kelesi, the, the Roman Orthodox Church, because they were, they call themselves Romans. Um, that's why the Russian, one of the Russian dynasties chose the name Romanov, Sons of Rome. Um, but the name for the Byzantine Empire was not the Byzantine Empire, it was, it was the Roman Empire. Because when Rome, the Western Empire fell by the 500s, Constantinople was still going strong and they were the Eastern Roman Empire. And they considered themselves Romans, and uh, Greek speaking, but Rome. So it's an interesting historical part that's lost on us. But this creed was supposed to uh, be a summary of the various Christological debates. Who is God? Who is Christ? How is the church? So you, you were hearing doctrine, right? Born of the Virgin Mary, like the, Jesus is truly God. Uh, truly God, light of light, God, you know, true God from true God, begotten, not made. All of these were doctrinal debates in the early church. And the emperor, Constantine, and the council were trying to um, conclude, stop the debate in the empire. You probably notice pictures with a crowned man surrounded by bishops that was not the Pope. That was the Byzantine Emperor. That, no, that was the Roman Emperor. That was Constantine. The Pope did not have power at that time. The Pope was the Bishop of Rome. And that was it. He was important, but he was not more important than the Emperor. The Emperor was far more important than the Pope. Um, and by this point, the Italian Peninsula was in decline. And so eventually, there was no more Emperor in Rome. The Pope was still there, surrounded by what were called the Barbarians who eventually became what we know as Europeans. So all of you who are of European descent are actually barbarians. <laughs> um, because you know, the barbarians invaded the Italian Peninsula. Of course, they intermarried with everyone. So there's no such thing as racial purity. Um, if you ever thought there was, there's no such thing as a wasp either. Because there hasn't been an Anglo-Saxon since 1066. Um, there, you could be an Anglo-Norman, but you can't be an Anglo-Saxon. All right. So this was deemed an act of worship. And since we're, Ukraine is in the news, this is a church um, in western Ukraine, the Cathedral of the Holy Gormishin and Pochayiv in Ternopol province in Ukraine. Ternopol was actually part of Poland at one time, um, before, uh, between the, the, the interwar period, up until World War II, then it became part of the Soviet Union. Um, but this church, which is under the Moscow Patriarchate of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, this is a big debate in Ukraine. Who do you follow? There are Ukrainian Orthodox that follow their own patriarch in Kiev, who use the Ukrainian language in their liturgy. Um, there are Greek, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians in Ukraine that use Old Church Slavonic, which is not Russian or Ukrainian. It's closer to Bulgarian. It's the early language that Cyr Cyril and Methodius, the, the makers of the Cyrillic alphabet, so the Slavic, the Proto-Slavic language that the liturgy was translated into from Greek, they still use that as a sacral language. No one speaks Old Church Slavonic, but that's what they use in Russia. So this church use, still uses Old Church Slavonic. However, what's happening in Ukraine now means that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate is like very angry because the Patriarch of Moscow, who's a political figure, is siding with Putin. And so they're like, they're what's called an autonomous church. They're under the patriarch, but they govern themselves. And they're distancing themselves from Russia right now because of what's going on. They, you know, they are Ukrainian. Others, um, so the Orthodox Church in Ukraine reflects the history of Ukraine. And then in the far west of Ukraine, they are what's called the Gretzky Katoliki, the Greek Catholics. Ukrainian Catholics who follow the Byzantine rite. So their liturgy is Eastern Orthodox but they acknowledge the Pope. And that's because of the history of Western Ukraine, which was much closer to Poland and, and the West. So they, in the 1500s, they united with Rome, but not in liturgy and traditions. Their priests are married, just like Eastern Orthodox priests. Their bishops are monks who are unmarried, just like Eastern Orthodox bishops. Um, and they, if you didn't know better, you wouldn't know that it wasn't Orthodox. They, uh, but they acknowledged the supremacy of the Pope. I asked a, 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 a Ukrainian Catholic priest in Kiev, I was like, well, okay, 
what percent do Ukrainian, uh, you know, the Gretzky Katoliki, accept Catholic doctrine, you know, like as in Rome? Um, that, and he said, eh, 80%, <laughs> you know, 20% probably not. You know, the things like the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin, which means that the Virgin Mary was without sin when she was born, not, has nothing to do with the virgin birth, classic mistake. And the, um, the various doctrines like papal infallibility, they, he would say probably they don't, and they don't care. Uh, but what's interesting is the, Gre the, Eastern, the Ukrainian Catholics are considered the liberals in Ukraine. They're more liberal than the Eastern Orthodox. Um, so some people favor them because they tend to be more flexible. Protestant community in Ukraine is very tiny. The Jewish community was once very large, but the Nazis <coughs> destroyed them. There's still some, uh, especially in Odessa um, and in Zhitomir, there's still, large, there's still some large communities left, um, but much, much smaller than they were before World War II. But this is a, a huge, this is a monastery cathedral. Uh, it's, it's absolutely enormous. Um, and um, this is the entire congregation singing this creed. I'm not going to play the whole thing as an act of worship because the creed was considered part of worship, not just a statement of faith. So the deacons are saying, wisdom, li wisdom, let us be attentive. That's what, and then they sing. So you'll hear the deacons turning to the congregation. <laughs> from the mention of Pontius Pilate in the creeds is to date it. It's not that Pontius Pilate was responsible necessarily for the crucifixion, but they want you to know when it happened. It was during the governorship of Pontius Pilate. So when it says he was crucified, um, I have to think about it in my head now, um, and in Jesus Christ, it like was suffered under, Pontius, suffered under Pontius, Pontius Pilate. Pilate. Yeah, suffered under, not under Pontius Pilate, as in Pontius Pilate did it, but during the reign of so some of the creeds actually say under, during the reign of Pontius Pilate, it would be more accurate. But you can see that this is an act of worship, and they're all singing it. Um, what did you notice about the church and what people were doing? They were signing themselves, which in the Orthodox tradition is you make your, hold your hand up. Do it with me. It's okay, nothing will happen. Um, um, put these two fingers, the pinky and the next one, down and put the three fingers to, with your thumb like together like this. That indicates the three for the Trinity and the two fingers are the two natures of Christ, truly human and truly divine. And then you go, Father, Son, to the right, Holy Spirit. The Latins to the left. And they do it this way with the palm. And they go left, right. 
the Greeks say the spirit is right, you know, you should go to the right and left. The, the Armenians and the Latins do it the Latin way, the Western way. Everyone else in the East does it the other way. Why? Who knows? Which side but, of the road did they drive on? What's that? Which side of the road did they cross? <laughs> but they drive on the same yeah, side yeah, as we. Yeah. It's only the British and the Japanese yeah, and a few yeah, others that do the left drive. But and the women's questions. heads were all covered. Yeah. They are covered, yeah, which was, oh, no. yeah. they are still, it's not mandatory, but it's customary. Some women won't, but many do. And most in that church would. Um, that was the case. What other church required head coverings from women in church? Up until Vatican II in 65, women had to cover their heads to enter a church, and men had to uncover their heads to enter a church. But Protestants, um, <clears throat> while they didn't require it, a lot of women wore hats to church, and men could not wear hats no, in church. Jackie Kennedy didn't yeah. wear a hat, so that was that. <laughs> she stopped the, the pillbox hat and was like off, so everyone else did it, right. All right. Did you have to get the opportunity to go to that church? No, not this one. I've been to lots in Kiev. You have, you have a rough idea how old that one is? Um, this one is uh, 1500s. It's relatively new, relatively speaking. It was originally built as a Baroque church for the Eastern Rite Catholic Ukrainian Gretzky Katoliki, but it changed to Orthodox because um, when the when the border shifted, when it became part of the Russian Empire, the a lot of the Greek Catholics had to become Russian Orthodox because they were in the Empire, and the Emperor said you can't be Catholic anymore. You know you have to follow the Patriarch of Moscow. So it changed. That's why there's so many competing jurisdictions in Ukraine because their borders have shifted repeatedly since the, the 1300s it's been owned they have been owned by others not somewhat analogous to Ireland you could say that was always under the suzerainty of interesting enough Pope Adrian who is the only English Pope ever gave the Lordship of Ireland to um, King Henry the I think it was Henry the first um, or I was the letter King John um, in the 1100s. So his title was Lord of Ireland, not King. Henry VIII changed his title to King of Ireland. But so from about the year 1000 or so, the, the English were larger, uh, began to, it was basically a fiefdom of the English crown, but before that it wasn't. But Ukraine has a similar history of being a fiefdom of, of other powers that were had more <coughs> power, right? Okay. So what is Faith. This, who is this? Martin Luther. Oh, yeah. yes. But, and Luther would have said the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. Lutherans do say these both in their truth. If you go to Trinity Lutheran in Worcester, you would hear the Creed every Sunday of some sort, usually the Apostles. Um, so the word faith comes from the Latin fides, um, and um, it means to have confidence in it. Like, <coughs> Confidence, fide is in there, to have confidence or trust in something. So faith can be defined as trust. Luther said, faith is trust. So Albert Richel, the Lutheran, a great Lutheran theologian of the turn of the last century in Germany, said religion is trust. You know, the, the whole point of religion is what do you trust in? What do you trust in? That's what religion asks. Um, so Luther's a famous quote from his larger catechism of 1529 was, that which your heart clings and entrusts itself to is, I say, really your God. What your heart trusts and clings to. If your heart trusts and clings to money, that's your God. And we are, the, we are a capitalist country. So a lot of people in this country have money as a God. Um, if your heart clings to power, that's your God. You could argue that all the despots of history, dictators, whoever, power was their God. Um, so Luther was quite emphatic. He was like, whatever you put your trust in is your God. And so, and if you don't, if it's not in God, then you're in trouble, so to speak. Um, and so we all know who Luther was, but my, my class at BC does not. So a German um, monk, he was an Augustinian monk. Um, uh, and uh, uh, was very concerned about his salvation. Um, at the time in the Middle Ages, you know, uh, hi, these are, he's at the very end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance. Some say he was the last medieval. Um, he was so worried 
like, how do I know I'm saved? What do I have to do? He was like, this was, he was tortured by this. And so because he was a New Testament scholar um, by profession, and when he was studying the Paul's letter to the Romans, that's when he centered in on Paul's idea of salvation by faith alone through grace, or grace alone through faith alone. So the gratia, so the fide. And this was the great relief for Luther, which then prompted him to criticize the sale of indulgences, um, which were ways that people thought that they could, um, in a sense, earn or borrow merit. So the church was selling indulgences largely to fund St. Peter's in Rome. Pope Leo X was building the basilica in of St. Peter's in Rome. He needed money. Um, the indulgences were, indulgences originally were a mission for the temporal penalty of sin. So back in the early church, sins were confessed publicly, not privately. And penance was public. You had to do, you know, sometimes you had to uh, do works um, to, to, as penance. And so originally indulgences were a way to pay for not having to do those temporal works. Nothing to do with divine forgiveness. Eventually in the Middle Ages, the idea was that you could purchase time out of what? Purgatory. Purgatory. Purgatory the intermediate state. So it would reduce the length of your time that you had to pay for temporal sins in purgatory. You often, and then the idea was you could purchase them for relatives. And it was called the treasury of the merits of the saints. Um, so it, Luther immediately said, well, if salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, um, then this is ridiculous. There's no, so you can't earn anything. You can't buy anything. You can't bargain with God. Um, but this was in the Middle Ages, a lot of people thought that they, they had to do something to get in, or at least to reduce their penalties in the intermediate state. So this is this prompts the Reformation, which Luther never wanted. Luther thought he was a reforming a reformer within the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the universal church. Um, but that did not pan out that way. To this day, many Lutherans will say we are reforming. A seminarian told me this from one of the Lutheran seminaries, we are a reforming movement in the Catholic Church. And I was like, 500 years later, you still say that? It's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. <laughs> you, know, like, you really clung to that. Oh, well, you know, keep reforming. I don't know if it's going to work. But nothing, you know, maybe Vatican II was your doing because a lot of the reforms would have pleased Luther. But yeah, anyway, I thought it was kind of like, really? I, I was like, you're not serious, are you? He was. Um, so the Apostles' Creed would be more the objects of the faith, of faith in Christianity. The Apostles' Creed was often favored, especially by Protestants, because it was easier and shorter. Um, Calvin preferred it because it mentions the communion of saints, which was important to him. So this is the translation from the Book of Common Prayer of 1662, which second to the Shakespeare and the King James Version of the Bible has influenced the English language the most. The first Book of Common Prayer under Edward VI was in 1549, um, and then 1552. Then Elizabeth brought back Catholicism after it was briefly restored by Mary Tudor in 1559. And then after the restoration of the monarchy, after the beheading of Charles I by the, by the actually by the Puritans, by us, um, uh, by the, uh, the, the battles between the independents and um, the royalists, um, the, glory, the restoration of Charles II as king in 1660 um, resulted in a revision of the Book of Common Prayer, and that's the one that's still official in the Church of England, although they use other liturgies. And that was handed down to us. So the reason we say trespasses in the congregational churches largely instead of debts is the Book of Common Prayer translation. The King James Version uses debts, debts and debtors. In fact, in Latin, it's debts. Um, so the Latin Lord's Prayer, um, Dimitri nos debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So ironically, the Catholic Latin version sounds very Protestant, but, uh, the, but debts in the King James Version, that's why Presbyterians and Scots especially don't use trespasses because they didn't use the Book of Common Prayer. That was for the English. Uh, but we trespasses was handed down to the Congregationalists who separated from the Church of England. 
So the first Puritan ministers were often, almost always, ordained priests, even though they didn't like the word, in the Church of England. And so that's why we use trespasses. Okay, so this is accepted by almost all Christian churches, with a few exceptions. Even Baptist churches accept it, though they don't use it normally in worship. So the first clause is, I, is monotheism, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in God, not gods, the Almighty. And the fa- this is really important for Christianity is the, re- the monotheistic religion that emphasizes a personal relationship to God. We use human terms like father. We don't, you know, which in Islam is forbidden. Can't call God father. God is too holy and different to be a father. Only humans are fathers. In Judaism, used very rarely. Once a year in Yom Kippur, at the ser- one of the services, they pray a prayer called a- a- Avinu Malkinu, our father, our king. And that's it. But rarely do they use it. But Jesus says you should use it all the time. Like, always refer to God in parental terms, familiar terms. So Christianity is the monotheistic faith that emphasizes personal relationships to the deity, which other monotheistic faiths do not, not really, Um, in part because they don't want to offend the sanctity of the deity by being too familiar, right? You know, you can't, don't act like you're, you know, you're just a human, you're just a creature. Um, So that idea. Maker of heaven and earth, so the idea of creation. <clears throat> and then it moves into the Christological part. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. So um, the, the, this idea that the, this God has a son, again, very familial. Now, you can't say this in Islam and in Judaism. There's no such thing as son of God. Um, God does not have children. So this is, you know, this idea, this would offend the Unitarian idea that God is a unity of, of only one entity, one person, one God. But Christianity is largely Trinitarian, uh, this tripersonal God, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And so this is emphasizing the salvation history. How are we saved? We are saved by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had a miraculous birth to the Virgin Mary, who suffered during the reign of Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. And the reason they're saying this, in part, is to combat some of the earliest church heresies. One was docetism, the idea that since God was too holy to become flesh, it was Jesus' appearance was a phantom. Docete, do. Uh, the word docetism is Greek, do, dokatis, which means phantom. Um, you know, so it was a, a CGI, a compu- like a generation. It was a fall. It was an image for the benefit of humans. So God appears as Jesus Christ, but really there was no person. There was no flesh. The birth was generated by divine power. So you could touch Jesus, but it was only because God can do anything. But Jesus was not, did not take flesh because no deity would take flesh. Because we have to remember, you have to remember that Christianity evolves in the Greco-Roman world, which means that Greek philosophy is dominant. To the Greeks, the idea of a god taking flesh was absurd. You know, Plato was like the, the, the human, the real human is the soul, not the body. The body is alien. And so when this, this idea of an incarnate deity, an deity that, that is born into humanity and is in diapers, as a baby, was, was absolutely absurd to the Greeks. So when they, it was one of the first critiques of Christianity. It was like, you have a God that was born a baby? A poor baby, nonetheless, not a king? This is absurd. So then you have Tertullian. You may have heard of uh, Credo Quia Absurdum. I believe because it's absurd. It's actually a misquote. But he's arguing back and forth with others who are, are critiquing this. Like, how, this is a, your God is absurd. No God would take on base flesh. Um, And this idea that the flesh was evil was very, very strong because of the Greek influence that the flesh was actually not ideal. And where the idea is to get out of the body, not to stay in it. It was so strong that St. Ambrose of Milan, one of his words for the flesh was sacus decorum, these bags of shit. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, you know, he had a fairly low estimation of the flesh. Which is another reason why Christianity has a huge problem with sexuality. Because sexuality was animalistic and fleshly. And again, with Platonism, well, you know, souls don't do such naughty things. And don't eat or poop or whatever. So thank goodness. So I can't wait to get out of the body. And so that's a very dominant strain in the first centuries of the church because it's in that world. You know, it's been by 90 CE. You already hear in the Gospel of John this distancing itself from Judaism. The reason that the Gospel of John is always saying because of the Jews, escaping from the Jews, Jews are bad. It's because the Johannine community were Jewish Christians that were kicked out of the synagogue. So they were Jewish Christians, Greek speaking, but they used to go to the synagogue. Most Christians, early Christians, very early Christians, still went to the synagogue um, and, and had their additional beliefs. And they were Jewish, Jewish Christians. Um, so were the Johannine community, but they, by 90 CE, they were, they were excommunicated for their for heretical beliefs about the Messiah. Like, you can't be a Jew and believe Jesus was the Messiah, wasn't the Messiah. So they were kicked out, and that's why they're so angry. So that's why they're always saying these things that sound anti-Semitic. Well, they're not anti-Semitic because they are Semites. Um, they're angry. That's why they're always saying because of the Jews, Jesus was taken away by the Jews. So by this point, you have a distancing of Christians. The Jewish community that converts is no longer is starting to no longer identify as Jewish. And that's what you're hearing in the Gospel of John. It starts about 90 AD. And eventually Christianity becomes an entirely Gentile religion. What's a Gentile? Not, 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 not Jewish. Not Jewish. So the word for Gentiles, or, well, Gentiles comes from Latin, which means nations. So the word, what's, a, what's the Yiddish word, which Goyim. is actually Hebrew for a Jewish, a non-Jewish boy? Goyim. A goy. Um, so the word goyim in Hebrew means the nations, uh, except for Israel. Ha goyim, the nations. Ha goy means the either a nation or a person of a non-Jewish nation. What's the Yiddish word, not, not Hebrew, for a non-Jewish woman? A shiksa. Oh, yeah. You're marrying a shiksa. <laughs> right. What? The kids won't be Jewish because you have to be born of a Jewish womb to be Jewish. Therefore, one of the worst things you can do as a Jewish man is marry a non-Jewish woman. Um, if the woman is Jewish, the children are by law Jewish. Um, but still, interfaith marriage is forbidden in all streams of Judaism. A lot of people think that it's, it's allowed in liberal Judaism. It is not. No reform or reconstruction rabbi will marry a Jew to a non-Jew. There are mercenary rabbis who don't have a synagogue for a reason and who will do it for a hefty $10,000 fee. Um, and people do pay it so that you can have Jewish rituals at your interfaith wedding. Um, but if, you, if you're a, a devout Jew and you marry a non-Jew, they won't stop you, obviously. Um, if you're Orthodox, they will, be very, they will probably not welcome you. If you're reformed, they'll say, well, you can have a secular wedding in a courthouse. And we, you're still a Jew, and you're welcome to synagogue, and even your non-Jewish partner is welcome to synagogue, but we will not do a Jewish wedding for you. That does not happen. I remember my friend Rebecca uh, Barkowitz married, and I remember I was talking to her about this when I was in high school. And she was thinking of dating a non-Jew, and they're very, they used to go to synagogue all the time, Temple Israel in Boston. And I was like, and my, she said, my mother's worried that I might marry a non-Jew. Now, her mom's people survived the Holocaust. Hmm. Um, her mother s escaped in, just before the border closed in 1938 um, and went to New York. Um, the rest of the family was killed. Um, and I said, well, you're reform, right? So what's the big deal? And she goes, we're still Jews. We don't do that. We don't marry outside. And I was like, well, she married, she married Daniel Barkowitz. Safe. <laughs> so, um, mom was happy. Still is. They have very. They all have Jewish children. Sarah, the whole thing. They actually are reformed, but they keep kosher. Interesting enough, um, the reformed Jews were enculturated to the local, and they stuck to society in Germany, where it was founded in the 1840s. And they wanted to enculturate and be German, not to be separate. So they stopped keeping the kosher rules. They became Germans, except that they kept their religion, the ethical part, but not the ritual part. Some of the ritual part. 
Um, but recently, there's been a reintroduction of more Hebrew, more ritual. A lot of Reformed Jews now keep kosher by choice. They don't have to, but she keeps a kosher home. Her, her grandmother, who's passed, and I knew her, she was this great lady who was from pre-war Berlin and escaped to New York in the late 30s, lived to be about 100 years old. She, she used to say, she's like, I don't understand, Rebecca. You, you, you have a kosher home, but when you go out of the home, you're not kosher. So that means your stomach isn't kosher, but your home is. <laughs> and Rebecca was like, but it's an identity thing. You know, I want to, it's my tradition. She's like, it doesn't make, because her grandmother was raised in the classic German reform tradition. It's like, no. Like, she used to tell me, I remember when she talked about the Holocaust, she said, we were German. Like, but Nuremberg stripped them of citizenship. We were Germans. We fought in World War I. We voted, we had held office. We didn't think of ourselves as separate. We were German, not living in a shtetl, like, you know, in Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof. They were integrated into society, into middle class, mainstream society. And so the shock, that's why so many Jews died in, they didn't leave even though they had the money, because they couldn't believe it. Her whole family was like, this is never gonna happen, you know, we're German. Right. But it did, it did happen, and so, but that secular, that idea that we are, so now we're American, like what, what's this whole kosher thing? That was for a thousand years ago. Why are you doing that? Interesting internal debate. <coughs> he descended into hell. This is a really interesting, it's not in the Nicene Creed. Um, uh, I like it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so weird, isn't it? It's called the Descensus. Um, what it means is up to a diff, there's different interpretations. Modern translations say he descended to the dead. Um, this is Holy Saturday. After Good Friday, this is Holy Saturday theology. Um, and this, the dissensus means different things to different people. In the Eastern tradition, the dissensus is when Christ in his deity, because he's dead in his humanity, the, the body's in the tomb, goes to hell and destroys it. He destroys Satan and the hell and breaks it open and empties it out if there's anyone in there. So hell is destroyed. And this is a strong trend in Eastern theology, although it's not universal. Um, but in the West, it meant something a little bit different. It either meant that he descended to Hades, not hell, because hell is a construct that developed in the Middle Ages. The burning hell didn't exist in the early church. Um, the, the realm of the dead to deliver the, the Jews who were waiting for the Messiah, but, you know, to let them into heaven. So that's what it became in the West. But in the East, it became a victory over the powers of evil. So Christ and his deity descends into hell and destroys it and then resurrects on Sunday to complete the victory, which is why I like it. But it is confusing, so people usually go with the other translation. The third day he rose again from the dead. This is the Easter moment on which the church either, you know, uh, the Paul says, if we don't believe in the resurrection, we are to be pitied amongst all people. This is the great dogma of the church, the, you know, the event of the resurrection, which to many people is unscientific and is not possible, so they debate it. But it's very interesting how this is that crucial linchpin because our own tradition says if we don't believe in the resurrection, you know, our faith and the church falls. We can talk about that another time. Um, he is sent into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence to come to judge the quick and the dead. This is where the word quick and the dead comes from. Quick means living, quickening. So the quick and the dead um, means living and the dead. So this is the second coming. So this is all a salvation narrative. Christ was born. Christ died, Christ was crucified, Christ rose from the dead, Christ ascends into heaven, Christ sits in the throne of power, and Christ will come again to judge the living and dead at the end of the world. Because like all monotheistic religions, Christianity is teleological. It believes in the, lat, the telos, the end, the end day, the day of ju judgment day. Islam and Judaism both all have a judgment day. The third part is the doctrine of the church. Yep. Where, where does the uh, judgment day in Judaism come from? They don't talk it's about it too it? much. It's called the, it's, it's, it's referenced in the prophets, not in the law. It's usually called the day of the Lord. 
And it's very, like all things about eschatology, about the last things in Judaism, it's purposefully vague. They, it's in the mystical tradition. They do talk about this. They don't dwell on it because in Judaism, your focus is this life, not the next life. It's olam hazeh. Hazeh means this life. Olam haba, the life to come, will take care of itself. So they believe in it. So yom, um, you have the day of the, yom ha, well, yom Adonai, you have the day of the Lord um, is spoken about, like in the prophet. Uh, in the book of Daniel and some of the apocalyptic in Judaism but it is just it's it's there there is such a thing as the judgment day but they don't dwell on what happens and so it's not developed and most rabbis would say that's a good thing that's not for you to worry about when it happens if it happens it will happen whether you believe it or not so to speak yep and the previous slide, the first line, said he rose again from the dead. Is that, was the first time to go to hell? Okay, um, why does it say again? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't in the original. It's English. He rose. Resurrexit. Tertia die. He rose on the third day, resurrexit. So it doesn't say again. Okay. So you're right. It's a it's a it's an Englishism, Anglicism. Um, I believe in the, so the Holy Spirit creates the church. There is no church without the Holy Spirit. So the day of Pentecost is the birthday of the church. The day of Pentecost is when Jesus departs, sends the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, upon the disciples and the apostles. The church is created. The church, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is the God that we have now. We don't have Jesus in the flesh. We only have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that which converts us, which gives us grace. The Holy Spirit is that which is active in the sacraments and in the rituals of the church. The Holy Spirit is that which ordains ministers and confirms people, etc. So everything about the church is the Spirit, even though we tend not to say that, but that's the, the God within our world today is the Spirit. Um, the Holy Catholic Church, interesting enough, Protestants did not give up this word. If you go to a Presbyterian church, they always say Catholic, small c. Um, it means universal. It does not mean Roman Catholic. The origin of the term Roman Catholic Church is the Reformation. So the refer at the Reformation, um, the, the, the Church of Rome, so interestingly enough, in, in Roman Catholic canon law, it's called the Ecclesia Romana, the Roman Church, because there are other Catholic churches like the Ukrainians who are not Roman. Um, but the, the, the typical Reformation approach to the Catholic Church was to call it the Roman Church or the Church of Rome, like the Church of England, you know, the national church. Um, and one of the official names of the Roman Catholic Church is the One Holy Catholic Apostolic and Roman Church, meaning that the church that is centered at Rome is the one true church. Now, the Eastern Orthodox also claim to be the only one true church, not Rome. So they're, they're, they're rivals on that one, although they've reconciled in recent years to acknowledge each other. Um, the Oriental Orthodox, the Armenians, the Coptics, the Ethiopians also claim to be the one true church. And there are several Protestant groups that say, no, 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 we are the one true church, and you are not. Um, mainline Protestants tend not to play that game. They used to, but they don't anymore. We tend to think of like there are, you know, Christians are Christians, and therefore the Catholic church, small c, is everywhere and it's not confined to a denomination. Certainly that's what the UCC would say. But uh, the Presbyterians, the Anglicans, and the Lutherans generally kept the word Catholic. In Germany, before the Reformation, there was a tendency to translate the word Katholisch with Christlich. And so some Ger uh, Lutheran translations of the creed say, one holy Christian church, or the holy Christian church, or the one holy apostolic and Christian church, However, the trend now is to go back to the original Catholic because of that claim that, no, we are part of the one universal church. So Protestants began to call the Catholic church, the Roman Catholic church, to say, no, you guys call yourselves the universal church, but you're the Roman universal church, which means you're not. So ironically, the Roman Catholic was invented by Protestants, not by Catholics. They just called themselves the church when there wasn't any other. Calling it the Catholic church was redundant until the Reformation. Does that make sense? Yeah. You with me? Mm -hmm. Tom? 
How can you be uni the universal Roman church? That seems like... Well, in other words, they were... So it's interesting. Some of the early texts, like in England, were like... And the Catholics, as they call themselves, <laughs> they're, like, they're not, but you know, the so so called Catholics. Um, so Protestants said, no, there's only one universal church of which we're all a part. But they were willing to concede that there are other portions besides the Church of England, Church of Scotland, the Lutherans. Um, so this idea that the the idea that there's a singular organized universal church doesn't exist for Protestants. It does exist for the other churches, though. They do consider themselves organically the true church. And the rest uh, of us are all heretics? Yes, and schismatics too. So we separated and we're heretics. It's a twofer. So, <laughs> so the one universal church, because the idea is, and this is universal to Christians, there can be, only can be one church. Jesus didn't create multiple versions of the church. There's only one church for the Christian. So the church of Jesus Christ, so or the church of Christ. So. That's not really in debate. It's, the debate is about who owns it, so to speak. Um, the communion of saints. This does not refer to the dead. Although maybe Roman Catholics often think it means the communion of saints in heaven. It does not. It means the communion of saints on earth and in heaven. That we are united as saints on earth, those in Christ on earth, to those who are past in heaven if they are conscious of us at all. Why is it capitalized then? Oh, that's just the Book of Common Prayer's capitalization, which is t totally random. If you look at early texts, the capitalization was completely random. Um, sometimes things are capitalized, sometimes they're not. So that's not, uh, I don't know why it's capitalized in that, but probably because the BCP, which has random capitalization all over the place, um, did that. PowerPoint did it. Maybe it was me. <laughs> Maybe I forgot. Um, because forgiveness is also capitalized, but there's no reason for that. The forgiveness of sins, the idea that the, that the church can forgive sins, that people can forgive sins, which actually was reserved to God alone in Judaism and Islam. You can't forgive anyone's sins, only God can. There's no, you can't go to confession in Judaism. You can confess to God and hope God forgives you, but you don't know. But Jesus gave that authority, said the sins you forgive shall be forgiven. So in some it's sacerdotal, meaning priests, but in, in, Pro, in liberal Protestantism, it's anyone. Anyone can forgive sins. So that idea that there's forgiveness of sin, the ministration of forgiveness is available. Luther said there were three sacraments in the church. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, and penance. He actually wanted the Lutheran church to keep ministerial forgiveness of sins. Some Lutherans did, most did not. They still offer it, but it's, it's optional. Technically, the UCC offers it too. There's a ritual for the called reconciliation of a penitent. Probably the least used thing in the UCC because anyone can do it. You don't need to come to me. You could, but you don't need to. The one reason you might come to me is because under priest penitent privilege and civil law, I can't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Question. That would be not fun, but you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway. Yep. Uh, I've always wondered about the, the term saints. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I think... Yeah, Which comes from the French, Anglo-Norman, or French word, holy. The holies. Saints, uh, the holy because, ones. You know, in American culture, you think of saints, you think of Catholic saints. But but Paul's letters is always talking about... To the saints. Things like, oh, I'm getting a collection to help the saints in Jerusalem. Yep. So what, what's the Greek word, and, and what does that mean? Agioi, or agii, is um, the holy ones. Sancti, in Latin, the holy ones. So it's it's just the we we got this from the French. Saint means holy. It's the sanctus in, in French becomes saint. So saints became the English word. So we differentiate. Um, in German, um, they do have a, a kind of faux Latin word, Sankt, like Sankt Petri Kirche. But the real word they use is Heilig, Heiligen. So alle Heiligen in German, all the holy ones. So the communion of saints is the communion of the holy ones, us. Do we know if Paul meant the, the believers? Well, if there were like some, he uses the word good believers. When he says like saints. to the saints of the church in Corinth, he says to the holy what, holy people. I see. So we're but we're not holy in and of ourselves. We're holy because of God. So we're made holy. We're sanctified by Christ. But so what he meant was, in Christ you are a saint. You are a holy. 
You are not holy because you're of yourself. You have no holiness. Does that make sense? Now, but it's a radical departure from Judaism, which would not call anything but God holy. You only call God kadosh. You don't call people that. It's very rare. It's a couple of people in rabbinical Judaism called like the Rambam, Maimonides, sometimes is referred to as our holy rabbi. But generally speaking, especially Orthodox Jews are very reluctant to say someone is holy. They might say righteous. He's a righteous man, a tzaddik. But to say holy, too, it gets a little bit too close to idolatry. You're not supposed to refer to people as holy. Um, but in Christianity, you do refer to people as holy. So the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, refer to each other as the saints. They are the church of the Latter-day Saints. So they call each other saints. And the Puritans also called each other saints. Um, so technically, you are all saints. Um, so no, there, I know that in, in American culture, we tend to think of Catholic saints, although any saint before the Reformation was collected. You know, St. Francis was canonized in the 1200s before the Reformation, so he's sort of common ground. And that's why there's little statues of St. Francis all over the place in parsonages, which is very strange. But um, a lot of UCC parsonages have these little statues of uh, St. Francis of Assisi, very trendy at the turn of the last century. To, like for some reason, Protestants decided we'd have, we have no saints except St. Francis. Um, he's cool. But, uh, so Protestants do have the idea of saints, it's just not restricted to canonized saints. You know, we do say St. Paul, St. John, if we want. Uh, but you could say St. Tom Porter. Unless you say <laughs> 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 yeah. You're supposed to say, don't say that, that's too Catholic. St. <laughs> Tom, you know, the church, can you imagine, in the future it'll be this, the, you know, the first congregational church of St. Tom, Thomas Porter. <laughs> you, you know things have changed by then. Um, for the better. For the better. So, Tim, I have a very uh, minor question. Yes. I know it's like devoted to the God, set apart to the God. Yes, that, which is what Kadosh in Hebrew means, literally, set apart. So it's like holy the other. Ones, the people who are set apart. Right. And so, in a way, the Pauline idea, so 40 CE, Paul starts to talk about you are a holy people, a royal priesthood. He's universalizing the priesthood, you know, the Kohanim, it's no longer the Kohanim, it's all of us. He's universalizing holiness to include, you were all set apart. Um, but originally, uh, the word kadosh in Hebrew um, meant holy with a W, holy other. You are entirely other than us. You are beyond and vastly superior to us. So that's what the word actually meant. Same as in, in, in Latin and in Greek, it was set apart for the gods. Um, that which is set apart. The gods were holy because they were, and you could, offerings could be holy set apart. Um, but Paul said to refer to ordinary people as agioi. So, um, the resurrection of the body. This is really interesting. There is no place in the New Testament where soul separation of death is ever mentioned. There is nothing that says the soul is immortal. There is nothing that says when you die, the soul pops out of your body like a pop tart <laughs> and flies away to some place never says it. In fact, the New Testament emphatically says you die and you wait for the resurrection. Um, it doesn't talk about soul separation. Soul separation is Greco-Roman. It's not Jewish. Not really. They did eventually develop this idea through the influence of Hellenism, but the idea that's universal almost in Christianity that when you die, your soul goes, you know, they're not there anymore. You know, right? Someone's gone. And of course, they certainly look like no one's there anymore. Luther actually taught what's called, what Calvin hated, called psychopanicism um, in Greek, but it, soul sleep. He said, he said he wasn't sure, but he thought the dead sleep in their grave. They wait. The soul is still alive, but it's sleeping inactive. Um, and he, he writes about this issue about, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he writes, how can Abraham serve God if he is dead? And he said, I don't know. 
if Abraham is conscious or unconscious. He still serves God because he's a servant of God. Even if he's unconscious, he serves God. He said, I don't know if Abraham is active um, because he's not resurrected yet. He's, he's dead. Um, so this idea uh, in, in modern Lutheran, Lutheranism, especially in the 70s, there's something that was developed called ganz tot theorie. Ganz tot, entirely dead. The idea is that, you know, it's a neo-Lutheran idea that when you're dead, you're dead. You're dead as a doornail. You know, grandma is not looking down upon you from heaven. You're dead. Um, she's not dead in the sense that her, what is her life lived, her soul is kept safe in God, in a sense, but she is dead. And she will not rise and be active again until the last day. Now, however, for the dead, they are always already resurrected. Do you understand what I mean? No. No. <laughs> Not exactly. Because Luther said, the moment of death is the moment of resurrection. You have no sense of time when you, like, like anesthesia. Do you remember, has anyone been under the knife? Do you remember the time from the, well, count, count backwards if they still do that, mm -hmm. and then you wake up as if no time has elapsed? For Luther, the dead, the moment of death is the moment of resurrection because whatever well, the billion years could have passed doesn't matter you won't know it's like that it's the twinkling of an eye that Paul talks about it a moment in the twinkling of an eye because the moment of your death is the moment of your resurrection and since the dead are timeless they're no longer bound by space-time because God is not bound by past present and future the dead are always already resurrected which ironically means that grandma really does see you, even though she died, she hasn't been resurrected for a billion years in time space. But since she's already timeless, she is no longer bound by time. So she does see you, whatever that means. So it's a bit of a mind bender. Um, but, this, but, the, but there is no, for Luther, because he was not interested in an intermediate state, he didn't like the idea of purgatory. So he said there is no intermediate place you go. You, you rise. The moment of your death is the moment you wake up into eternity. All right. Um, we're almost done. And the life everlasting. So resurrection in classic proto-Christianity precedes eternal life. The early Christians think of us as a body, soul, <coughs> unity. And so the resurrected life, the eternal life, is only given to people just so we... Christ is a prolepsis of us. Does anyone know what a prolepsis is? Want to try? Okay. Christ bursts into time space as an eternal being. Okay, not bound by time space, but he bursts in. He then departs. Um, how does he depart? He, is, he resurrects and he ascends. Um, so the early church fathers would say, just as Christ, so we. In other words, we must die, and we must rise. So the Christ event is our future. We shall have our own resurrection. Um, and, and so the interesting thing about that is that the gospel is not about conjuring away death by saying <coughs> death isn't real, their soul, you know, they're still alive. Death for the gospel is about suffering it and overcoming it. So this, the, the tragic part of Christianity is all of us have to go through Calvary. Just So the early fathers said, we have to follow Christ, literally. Our death is our cross. We have to pass through death to get to Easter. There's no other way. There's no bypassing. You know, so we ha our lives are per crucem ad lucem, through the cross to the light. You can't skip it. So what they're saying is that, that Christ essentially models what we all have to do. We all have to face mortality because he faced it, and we all have to pass from death to life in our own resurrection, in our own Easter moment. So, and of course, since this is unpleasant, most Christians try to find ways to uh, basically say, well, death is an, is an illusion. You know, like, they're not really... So those poems that you see at funerals, 
um, you know, nothing's really happened. I'm just next door. You know, I, I haven't really died. Death is fake. But early Christianity makes no bones about this. The Epistle of St. James says, but w what is your life? It is but a vapor that fades away. The early Christians had no concept that death was less than death. Death was death for them. When Paul says it's better for me to die and be with the Lord, what he means is the moment of his death is the moment that he resurrects. It doesn't mean that his soul pops out. Now Calvin disagreed. Calvin said the dead are with Christ as separated souls, which actually means that Calvin is following the medieval scholastic tradition of, of St. Thomas Aquinas and the Platonists and Aristotelians, because he likes that idea, but it's not in the Bible, which is ironic considering Calvin's approach. But he can't, he can't let go of that, while well, Luther was much more radical. And most Lutherans after Luther did not follow him. They, they kept the, the dualism, the body-soul dualism that the body separates from, the soul separates from the body, which is called anima separata. Yep? How much do we know about the early Christians, uh, the first Christians, the yeah, first Christians were, were, I believe, mostly Jews, and then there were Gentiles and Jews. Uh, well, the, the, if, if, up like, until about uh, the first, probably at least the first 60 years, they were mostly Jews. Uh -huh. But Paul's mission is to the Gentiles. Right. You know, so right. he decides already that the future of the church is going to be the Gentile community. Right. So if we look at the first hundred years, right, uh, and these two populations or mm -hmm. you know, the intermixing of these cultures, uh, do we have any idea about how much of the uh, the Greek dualism was a prevalent belief? In oh, it was almost. It was. Um, it was. It was extremely dominant. So some of the earliest church fathers, like Clement of Alexandria, the Great School of Alexandria, Origin of Alexandria, were all Platonists. Right. And they applied Platonistic philosophy to Christianity. Right. Um, and it was pretty easy to do. They were, it was a, good, it was a, a very a straightforward merger for them in some ways. And, and, and with that, uh, do they believe that then that uh, resurrection was resusta res resuscitation? That's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, origin um, within their belief system. Yeah, they they weren't really worried about resurrection that much because they did focus on the soul more. The soul for them was a sphere, the perfect shape, because it doesn't have any angles. It's it, that's why the circle is a symbol of eternity. That's why halos are a circle. It means eternal. It doesn't end. It keeps going. Um, they. Uh, they did believe in the resurrection, but for them it was this kind of transformation of all creation into immortal substance, transubstantiation of all. That's how they looked at it. Um, they, but they didn't, you're right, they didn't really, they didn't take the sort of uh, um, more Judaic or Semitic view that it was the sharp, you're dead and you're resurrected, soul, body, soul together. And you, you know, that faded very quickly um, because of the, the dominance of Hellenism. The, the whole empire was Greek-speaking, except for the Italian Peninsula, which was Latin-speaking. But even they spoke Greek because all the schools were Greek. Every every educated Roman spoke Greek. You had to. How did they understand, uh, you know, the uh, visitations of Christ after the resurrection? To the um, no, Christ um, after the resurrection. Christ is resurrected. So they, he was already transubstantiated into a So Paul says that our flesh is changed from mortal corruptible substance to immortal incorruptible substance. It is transformed. So whatever the body is, it's not this. This is transformed into something. Of, so the interesting thing for the Christian is that the second person of the Trinity, who is, who is the second person of the Trinity? The Son. What's his name? Jesus. Thank you. Good, you're all Christians then. Um, Jesus Christ still has his body in the triune God, in dogmatic theology. He's not bodiless. He, he is incarnate still. But the, the incarnate part is radically changed. So he is, he was, his substance is transformed from a time-bound, mortal, corruptible substance that can get sick, can get old, can die to that which is eternal. 
but still bodily. So that's the real issue, bodiliness versus non-corporeality. The Platonists preferred the idea of a non-bodily form, not like, no, not, not anything that had substance. But Christianity doesn't teach that. It teaches that we are substantial beings and that we will continue to be substantial beings even if we are eternalized. Does that make sense? So the idea for Christianity is that the cosmos is transformed from a, a substance that is subject to decay to a substance that is immortal and not subject to decay. It is radically changed. In other words, it becomes, it's theosis, divinization. It becomes like God. So God takes matter and transforms it into divinity. But it's still substantial. So Christianity's idea of the afterlife, whatever that is, is bodily, not spirits sort of floating around with no substance. Does that make sense? That's not what we're taught, though. We tend to be taught straightforward Platonism, that we are kind of these wispy things that float around. I don't know what they do. But, yeah. So if Jesus modeled what we are to do, that is, we are to go through our own Calvary and yeah. die, what happened to all of the people before Jesus modeled that for them? Or should we believe that Jesus is not bound by time, and so therefore he modeled it for them before he modeled it for the rest of us? Right. Um, both, in the sense that the, the, the Westerns tended to believe that basically everyone that wasn't in Christ went to hell. All pagans, all people before Christ, they're all just the massa damnata. Augustine calls humanity a massa damnata, a damned mass. Only a few of us make it. Easterns were very much more optimistic about this, and this later shifts that the, that the redemption is universal. <clears throat> and is retroactive because it's not bound by time. So the answer would be that it's, uh, Christ is salvific to all people at all time, everywhere. But the question is, when does that happen? And so the God's Tolk folks um, of the turn of, of the 70s said this all happens at the, res at the last day, when everything is radically transformed at the general resurrection. Um, it does, that, that idea doesn't work so well when you have this soul separating and you know, then rejoining the body at the last day and all that stuff, then it all breaks down, which is why they didn't like it. But they would say it's collective salvation. So Paul Tillich, the German-American theologian, said, salvation is not given to the separated individual. It is we are saved corporately. Not only humans, but all creation, collectively. It's not given to you and then to you, it's given to all, not the separated individual, which is really difficult for us as separated individuals to even imagine. But he said salvation is given to the human race, not to individual humans. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. But that was not what was taught for in the Middle Ages. That was not what was taught at the Reformation. They were still bound by uh, uh, dualism. Some people still are. If you, you know, talk to a Southern Baptist missionary, dualist. Heaven or hell is, you know, there's only two answers. That's dualism. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. You want more or you want to go? I'm ready to go. All right, Tom. <laughs> say Tom. <laughs> We actually went until 12.30, which was um, long, but you didn't seem to squirm or cough. You know, the classic, the preacher is preaching to like, <coughs> you know, I'm like, uh oh, that, just, that happened to me once. And my mom was in the congregation years and years ago in Winchester. I didn't know I was preaching that long. Uh, and she was like, and then I realized people started doing the cough, and I was like, uh oh. And then after, my mom was like, my mom was like it was good. It was long. <laughs> I was like, and I looked at the clock and I'm like, oh. And then I knew the senior minister would like be like, 
<laughs> I, could, I, I didn't see him. I think he was all we're going. <laughs> <laughs> not bound by time. <laughs> yeah, I, was like, I am not bound by time space. <laughs> you are a duelist. The duelist oppressor. Um, yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you professor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>